Adams. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, I'm very pleased to stand here this afternoon and take a call on second reading of the electoral referendum bill. And uh, as the Speaker has just resumed his seat, uh, I just want to, to refer back to, to the comments I made in respect of the previous bill uh, in regards to the way the Minister has approached this process, the way the committees worked, and, and the help uh, we've had from officials on both these bills. And can I simply repeat what I said in that context of that bill for this one, sir? I think the starting point on this referendum uh, from our perspective is very much that what I hear around New Zealand, and I accept I'm just one person and it's an anecdotal and, and far from scientific uh, feedback, is that most New Zealanders thought there was going to be a second referendum on MMP. Most New Zealanders, as I hear them talking to me, understood that when they elected by not an overwhelming majority, you'd have to say, to go to MMP back in 1993, they understood that there was actually going to be a second chance to come back and say what they thought about it. What they hadn't done, sir, is read the small print, which said, asterisk, bottom of the page, uh, if Parliament agrees. And that's where you know, they got lost in some of the technical detail. And of course, Parliament uh, looked at this issue in 2001, and actually by a very, very narrow majority at that time said, well, we won't have a second referendum uh, because we think it's a bit soon. Even then, they didn't say it wasn't necessary. They just said 2001 was a bit soon. And, and you know, it's always been our policy, and it was very clear going into the election, that we felt New Zealand actually should have that second referendum, uh, despite the sort of the technical wording going in the first time. And quite apart from anything else, if New Zealand does once more signal that it wants MMP as its voting system, then that, I think, will legitimise and put to bed this festering unease about whether or not we should have ever had a second say on it. One thing I do find slightly concerning, and I'll, I'll get this off my chest nice and early in the piece, is that there does seem to be a bit of a, a mood from, from the pro-MMP lobby to say, well, we've got the system we want, so there shouldn't be any more debate on it now. Having got MMP, let's shut it all down. And, and I don't think that's right. I think if, if we are firm in the views that MMP has worked well for New Zealand, and I'll be the first to, to say it's done, it's done some good things, then we shouldn't be afraid to put it back to New Zealand and say, OK, New Zealand, this is your chance. You've had the system now since 1996. How are you going? What do you think of it? Should we endorse it? And that's, that's always been the view of the National Party. And so in, in this bringing this bill in, our driver is to ensure that New Zealand has that chance and that the process is fair and that it's easy to understand. And for that reason, the committee, sir, has spent a lot of time actually on the, the ballot paper, uh, which is a schedule to this bill, to ensure that the language was as simple and as, as plain language as it could be. We took some expert advice on that. We spent a lot of time looking at the way the systems were described, their names, their order on the ballot paper, to do everything we could to ensure that there was no perception either for or against any particular system. Because, sir, as the chair of that committee, it was certainly my view, and I think shared by everyone on the committee, that what we needed to do was ensure all the systems were put up in an unbiased way so that the public could have their, have their say without you know, us sticking our fiddle in as to which system it should be. And for myself, I've been pretty careful not to, to take a stand on any of the systems because, as Mr Hodgson said, and I think quite rightly, that's actually not for us politicians to do. This is a referendum. It's for the people of New Zealand. And our job in passing this legislation is to ensure, as the Minister said in his opening contribution, that the process is clear, neutral and unambiguous. Can I just comment on the issue of, of the timing of the referendum? Because one way that this is different, of course, from the 92-93 process is that the decisions that's been made uh, by this government and this bill is that both of those referendums, if in fact there are two, will be held in conjunction with the general election. And we did have some discussion around that with submitters uh, during the, the, the uh, select committee process because, of course, what you get from combining them with the general election is a far higher level of engagement and, and voter turnout, and that is absolutely uh, something to be desired. I guess the counter to that and what you have to weigh up is that, you know, w will the referendum messages, and that they are some reasonably detailed messages and the, the differences in these systems, will they get lost somehow in the clutter of a general election campaign? And that's something we spent a bit of time discussing, and I think it's certainly a fair argument. Uh, but my strong view, and, I, and, and where the committee ended up, was that the importance of having a high level of voter engagement if the result of this referendum uh, is, is to have validity is, is absolutely fundamental. And so we have the process where both referendums, as I say, if there are two, will, will be in conjunction with general elections. Uh, and so I think that's important. 
It does lead me into to the issues of the public education campaign, which will be a key component of this. Uh, and coincidentally enough, following on from the last bill, we have a, a public election ca uh, campaign of, of around $5 million worth of money has been allocated for that. And against that, we have spending limits now on, on uh, independent campaigners in this process of 300000 and I think, sir, the, the relativity between those amounts uh, shouldn't, shouldn't go uncommented on because it is important that that public information is out there and, and dominates the debate. Uh, and certainly everyone is entitled to, to have a say in that. And let's, let's just make the point that that's 300,000 per campaigner and there could be any number of campaigners on both sides of this debate. Uh, and as I said in the first contribution, Arguably, the limit should have been higher. You know, that would have been where I would have started off. Uh, but that's where the committee uh, has come to on a consensus basis. The other thing I just want to comment on, and it cuts across both bills. I didn't make the point in the last one. I will briefly make it here. We were very concerned about the compliance cost of these limits. We didn't want to make it an, an overly onerous uh, regime. And so what we've done is only required returns, detailed returns, to be filed when campaigners are spending over 100000 So they're really playing in the big end of town. Uh, people out handing out a few leaflets and the like do not have to go through the expense of filing detailed returns. Uh, and we haven't made it an automatic auditing provision either, because we all know how onerous and expensive audits can be. Uh, what we've done instead is, is given the Electoral Commission the power to require an audit if they believe on reasonable grounds uh, that there is merit in that. And I think so that's a good balance between ensuring uh, that the system is robust uh, without imposing cost for the sake of cost. So uh, there's a number of other matters I'd, I'd very much like to talk about in this. It's a, it's a very, very interesting process and one I'm looking forward to seeing how it rolls out during the next year. Uh, but we will have more time during the committee stage. And so at this stage, sir, I'll simply end there and commend the bill to the House. Very good. Speaker.